Welcome to another in installment of our investigation of our microbiology textbook by Tortora. And today we'll be looking at the first half of chapter 12. We'll be looking at eukaryotes, the fungi and algae. And then in part two, we'll take a look at protozoa and helminths that cause uh, human diseases. <clears throat> There's a little micrograph showing some fungal cells. So first, let's take a look at something, some aspects of fungi. Mycology is the study of fungi. And mycosis is a fungal disease. And my, uh, fungi are chemoheterotrophs. They typically um, obtain their nutrition by releasing enzymes, which digest um, macromolecules in their environment, and they absorb the nutrients and make use of those for energy and for carbon sources. <clears throat> fungi produce, uh, reproduce by often forming spores, um, asexual and sexual spores, which we'll talk about those largely because of their diagnostic value in identifying uh, various fungal species, and they're interesting. So again, sexual and asexual spores. Uh, we have mentioned before that um, fungi uh, typically have sterols in their membrane, their cell membrane, those are cholesterol-like molecules in their cell wall. You may find chitin, a type of a polysaccharide, as well as glucans and manans. When we talk about molds, we're talking about multicellular uh, forms of, of fungi. <coughs> and um, the, the cells grow in thread-like structures called hypha, and a, and a mass of hypha is called a mycelium. And so the overall growing part of the, of the growing tissue is called the thallus, the mold. A lot of fungi can grow in unicellular form, and uh, we call them yeasts. And yeasts often pretty commonly divide by um, budding. The bud will form off the side of the cell and grow and then break off. There are also fission yeasts. Dimorphism is a property exhibited by some disease-causing fungi in which they are yeast-like at 37 degrees at body temperature, but then if you grow them at what we would call room temperature, a little bit cooler temperature, uh, they form mold-like structure, multicellular cellular forms. Pretty interesting. <clears throat> the hypha that are produced as, um, as multicellular forms grow could either have a, a cell wall between the cells, that are called septate hypha, or they may not. They may just have like a multicellular stalk that includes a cenocytic hypha. And you can see a spore germinating and giving rise to some cenocytic hypha. <clears throat> and there's some just a cool micrograph of aspergillus with some fruiting bodies, some aerial hypha sticking up from the surface of a mat of hypha. There's a picture of a budding yeast. You can see a bud uh, forming that's going to eventually break off and form a brand new. <clears throat> organism. There's some so-called scars. You can see some previous buds have formed up from this parent cell. And here's a picture with lots of mold-like growth. You can see the filamentous hypha. You can see some yeasts, some individual cells growing in the body. So again, the spores have different appearances that can be used diagnostically. Um, asexual spores that fungi produce may be called sporangiospores, and there's like a, a stalk with a sac on the end which a bunch of spores will form and be dispersed. Chlamydospores are a type of spore that forms within the hypha, the cells of the hypha. One may thicken, and a reproductive structure of spore will grow inside of that. And also conidiospores are <clears throat> some types of spores that grow on the end of hypha, so like break off the tips, and those, uh, those, are, uh, those can go off and start a new uh, growth. And there's a picture of a conidia forming and a conidia spores forming on the ends of those, those stalks. Here's some arthrospores, just long strands, long hypha, and just the tips breaking off. Um, they're called arthrospores when they form like that. And here we have some bud like spores forming, blastoconidia, with three different types of, of spores that you may see. Here are some chlamydospores forming um, 
inside of the hyphae because of the thickened areas that are giving rise to these chlamydospores inside the chlamydia. Sporangia, sporangiospores, there's like a sac like structure here. We have found some spores that are forming on the surface that are about to break off and re released. Sexual reproduction of, of fungi <coughs> has multiple steps. So, plasmogamy, we have two different hypha that represent the two different forms, the plus and minus form. We don't say male and female, but plus and minus forms, the hypha may grow along until cells encounter each other, and then the nucleus of one of those. Uh, hyphal cells will penetrate the cytoplasm of another that's called plasmogamy. And now we have a diploid cell. It has um, two nuclei in there. And it may actually grow in that form to form a structure with those multiple nuclei. And then eventually um, the nuclei may fuse, producing a true um, diploid uh, cell that can grow and grow, continue to grow in that diploid form. And then eventually the diploid cells will give rise to meiosis. And I should point out, um, there's a section at the beginning of this chapter on mitosis and meiosis. If you haven't uh, studied that at all, don't remember that very well from maybe biology in high school, review the steps of meiosis and mitosis. How cells divide. These are the stepwise processes by which cells divide. In meiosis, the cells will be reduced uh, by half in their chromosome count. And that's what those with the, the spores are, um, are half like they're called, they have half of the complement of chromosomes, and then when the two different forms come together, plasmogamy and karyogamy take place, then we have the diploid form in which uh, each uh, cell has a pair of homologous versions of each chromosome. So <clears throat> after karyogamy, we have diploid cells that can divide, and then after that we give rise to mitosis, and there's um, haploid spores, which we can then germinate on the haploid uh, hypha. All right. Uh, the sexual spores. Three types of sexual spores: zygospores, uh, ascospores, and basidiospores. And we'll take a look at those in a, in a little bit. We'll show. I'll show you a quick cartoon of some of the life cycles of these that form these three types of, of sexually reproducing spores. Um, the <coughs> type of fungi that produce those spores are called zygomycota. Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. There's also Microsporidia we'll mention in, the, in this discussion. Zygomycota, or zygomycotes, produce sporangiospores and zygospores. These are asexual and sexual types of spores that they produce. So those are diagnostic for those guys. And here's an example Rhizopus and Mucor are two different examples. Here's a little schematic diagram of the reproductive possibilities for Rhizopus. And you can see some hypha here that can give rise to this aerial structure, this sporangium, and it's like a, a sack full of, of spores that are going to form and be released. Sporangiospores are going to be released from that sporangium, and those can germinate and form a cyclical asexual reproduction process. Or multiple hypha, plus and minus hypha, can encounter one another and <clears throat> And they can meet together and form a zygosporangium, a plasmogamy happening, and then that zygospore will form, and uh, it'll be a uh, those diploid cells, karyogamy and meiosis will, will occur, which will go from a, a diploid cell structure to a haploid spore formation. The sporangium produces haploid spores, and out they come, and those again can germinate and go through cycles of sexual or asexual reproduction. So sporangiospores, the asexual form, zygo and zygospores are the, are the uh, sexual type of spores. You don't have to memorize that life cycle. I just want you to maybe make a list of these two types of spores that, uh, that um, zygomycetes will produce. <coughs> Mycosporidia do not form uh, a hypha. They're just intracellular parasites. Um, encephalozoan uh, intestinalis is a, is a disease causing microsporidium and so it's transmitted by fecal oral transmission and it takes up residence in the digestive tract and causes a, di causes a diarrheal disease. Ascomycotes. <coughs> Ascomycotes produce disease causing uh, species of fungi or including some uh, um, 
disease-causing species of fungi. And uh, they can produce, they're, again, they're telemorphic. They can produce, be produced by sexual and asexual spores. That's called telemorphism. Ascospores. We have some important species um, that, are, that are represented here. Blastomyces dermatitis and Histoplasma capsulatum. Those are two of only three different um, types of or species of fungus that can cause disease in, in uh, healthy adults. Only rarely they do. There's some, some, some uh, skin infectious ascomycotes. Ascomycetes. <coughs> so here we have a, an ascomycete that can uh, reproduce asexually by producing these arthroconidia, arthrospores that can break off from the conidia here. And uh, and if we have sexual reproduction in this case, we have um, <coughs> karyogamy and uh, meiosis forming a sac-like structure. So these are called sac fungi. That would be on there somewhere. Uh, so you see this little sac forming a handful of spores that can burst out eventually and can germinate and form asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. Either one. So the ascospore is inside the ascus, the sac, and then it will burst out, be freed, go on and germinate, whereas the conidia break off at the end of these, these this hyphal stalk here and that give rise to the germinating spores. Anamorphs are fungi that have no are no longer able to reproduce by sexual reproduction. They only do asexual reproduction. Um, penicillium is an extremely common um, type of fungus that is an anamorph. <coughs> Here's a couple of other very fairly important ones. Coccidioides is important because it causes can cause disease in healthy adults. Pneumocystis, as we'll see, is an opportunistic pack pathogen of people with immunocompromise. Candida albicans alp is very, very common also everywhere, but it, and it doesn't normally cause disease in people. It's not actually considered a pathogen. If you look at lists of pathogens, it's not included because it's just so common. It's in and on your body, but it doesn't cause disease unless, again, you have something wrong with you. You may have uh, immunocompromised by another disease or by um, extreme uh, fatigue or alcohol consumption or, or uh, HIV infection or something like that. <coughs> Basidiomycota um, <coughs> produce, uh, they're called club fungi. They produce little pedestals from which um, the spores will form. Uh, Cryptococcus neoformans is an example, um, but um, Basidiomycota include mushrooms. Uh, Cryptococcus could form, again, an opportunistic infection with people with immunocompromise. So here's a little diagram of. Um, a bit of basidiomycete in its asexual reproduction. And, um, and then in the sexual reproduction, you see the mushroom uh, thallus growing there, forming basidiospores. You see these little pedestals, almost like a little crown, and all the spores form as like buds in the tip of that pedestal, and the basidiospores are released and germinate and so forth. So that's the, <coughs> the look of a basidiomycete. Um, economic effects or value of fungi. <clears throat> there are some products. There's a, a, a cancer drug actually that's produced by certain fungi called Taxol. Um, cellulase enzyme is useful for breaking down cellulose, especially in this era when we're trying to find out how to harness various microorganisms for producing um, a fuel of various types. So cellulose is useful for breaking down. <clears throat> organisms that produce oils or have a lot of bio mass that can be used to produce maybe fermentation or produce ethanol. Um, so a bunch of fun fungal diseases. Uh, we'll look at um, some tables. I skipped over a little bit kind of quickly over a couple of them because they'll be showing up in these tables. Um, systemic mycoses uh, occur uh, throughout the body. They do some yeast get into the circulation or travel in various uh, in the, in the uh, lymphatic system. There's subcutaneous mycoses that get it in under the skin. There are numerous cutaneous mycoses 
uh, that actually infect the skin, which the microbes are eating the, the keratin of the skin and nails and hair. There are superficial mycoses that grow on the surface and on hair shafts. Um, some of the mycoses we'll see are opportunistic in nature. So here's a table of our opportunistic uh, fungi. Um, <clears throat> don't want you to memorize the types of spores that are formed. If you're a diagnostic clinician, you might want to know those things so that you could maybe um, in the laboratory uh, isolate and grow some various fungi and see what their uh, their morphology is. Um, Candida albicans, you should know because it's so common. It does cause um, vaginal infections and irritation on a pretty regular basis among healthy adults. So that's something that's well known and is worth mentioning, uh, but also um, thrush is an oral infection of overgrowth of, of candida that can occur, especially with people that have a uh, history of excess alcohol consumption, um, but also people with immunocompromised compromise can get uh, candida infections and life-threatening ones of that. <coughs> Pneumocystis urevetsii uh, was once considered diagnostic for AIDS, which is a very common cause of, of pneumonia. In people with immunocompromise. Uh, crypto, cryptococcus neoformans, again, uh, uh, is associated with uh, decaying um, guano from, from pigeons in the city where there's a lot of pigeons, and uh, that can cause systemic disease in people with immunocompromise that are careful about going downtown, exposing themselves to those, that kind of threat. <clears throat> Here are three species of fungus that can, can occasionally cause disease in healthy adults. Um, Blastomyces dermatitidis, so-called river fever, or North American blastomycosis. Uh, inspiration, in, inhaling the spores uh, can, can lead to a, a pneumonia disease, uh, and it can actually be life-threatening, but it will require medical treatment. Again, very rare. Um, Pistoplasma capsulata, so-called Ohio Valley disease, Ohio River Valley. Um, again, inhaling the spores as the route of transmission causes a respiratory infection, which occasionally can, can just cause a mild respiratory infection, but can cause systemic disease occasionally. Coscidioides imidis, valley fever from San Joaquin Valley in California. Um, an inhalation of spores causes a flu-like respiratory infection, but occasionally can produce systemic infection, life-threatening systemic infection. So those are the only three to really worry about in terms of major disease with fungi in healthy people. <clears throat> Skin infections are often called ringworm. It sounds like, first of all, it's caused by a worm and it sounds like a specific um, organism maybe, but it's not. It's just a general term for um, fungal infections of the skin. And here are some organisms that are common because of uh, Skin infections, microsporum, um, can cause tinea capitis, for example, in newborns. You see a cradle cap, a little, like a flaky looking, um, just you know, breaking off of layers of cells off the, the cranium, off the scalp. Trichophyton can cause athlete's foot. Um, Epidermophyton can cause um, an, uh, inguinal infection you know, around the genitals, inguinal area, in hot climates, especially where there's ton of sweat all the time and that, that warm sweaty um, um, fluid around the folds of the skin can, can allow incubation of these organisms. Um, <coughs> Stachybotrys, um, especially in areas where there's been flooding and a lot of fungus growing in a tropical area like after for example after Hurricane Katrina a lot of this fungus causing problems. Um, Malassezia uh, causes dandruff, cutaneous infections of, of the skin, so pretty common stuff. Lichens, just mentioned briefly, um, just because they're too fascinating not to at least mention, which you have a combination of a, an algae and a fungus. And so the, the fungus forms some forms um, hypha and mycelia, which form a, a, a structural support site for algae to grow, and the algae are photosynthetic, and so the, um, the, the lichen is this, com this um, symbiotic relationship between these two different types of organisms that allows them both to flourish. And here's some lichens growing on a tree. You may see lichens growing right on rocks, mountains, and trees. 
All right. Algae. A lot of different types of algae that are either worth mentioning just because of some claim to fame or because of uh, not because of diseases, but mainly of interest. Um, algae are photoautotrophs. Uh, they can be either unicellular or multicellular. <coughs> they often have pigments, chlorophylls that give them color. Here's a really cool diagram in which you can see different types of algae that form at different depths in the sea. And that's the reason for that is that different wavelengths of sunlight penetrate to different depths. And so different algaes have different um, types of chlorophylls that they use for photosynthesis that absorb uh, preferentially different wavelengths, different colors of light. So uh, green algae, brown algae, red algae, down here at the deep and the deeper waters. These are pretty deep waters. You're talking about 250 meters, 750 feet depth of water. Still enough light penetrating down there. Some instances for algae to grow. All right, brown algae. <clears throat> Brown algae, I'm sure you've encountered, if, if you've, unless you've been extremely landlocked all your life. <coughs> seaweed, if you see seaweed on the beach. Sargassum, it's probably brown algae for the most part. Uh, it grows it floating in the ocean, in shallow water, floating near the surface, and in huge masses. And every year it sort of washes up onto popular beaches and causes kind of a problem because just hundreds of thousands of tons of this stuff lands on beaches and starts to rot, and smells bad, and all the beach colors don't like it. The communities that are supported by um, tourism don't like it very much, but they don't really know what to do with it all. I mean, every so many years, really big blooms of it occur, and I've heard, I've heard that there's just tremendous amounts of it moving towards the um, Caribbean islands in Florida <coughs> right now. Um, Allergen is a gelling agent that's sort of isolated from brown algae. <clears throat> it's a polysaccharide that is handy for certain um, applications in food preparation and, and cosmetics and medicines. Um, kelp is a type of brown algae seaweed that's, uh, that's eaten as a source of nutrition. <coughs> that's eaten. Nothing like coffee can't cure. Picture some brown algae, <clears throat> which is actually even a little air. Some brown algae has little air cells that come out to float so it doesn't get too deep in the ocean and let the, let the, the blades and the stipe float up closer to the surface. Um, <clears throat> red algae, just mentioning it exclusively just because of its polysaccharide products that are isolated from agar that we use in the lab to this day all the time in microbiology comes from red algae. Carrageenan is a is a food thickener. If you next time you buy a half gallon of ice cream, look on the box and see. You may very well have carrageenan listed. And now you know this is a polysaccharide from from fungi or from uh, algae. <coughs> Green algae is I'm just putting on here exclusively because of for interest because it's thought to be the ancestor of all land plants. It's kind of impressive. There's some green algae growing. <coughs> Diatoms type of algae that's very interesting. They produce hard silica cell walls and um, almost like little petri dishes in which two interlocking halves of the cell wall form the hard shell. Inside of that is, a, is this organism. Um, they actually produce oil that accumulates within the, the, the cell wall and the fossilized diatoms produce the oil that we find in the ground. Um, uh, over millennia. <clears throat> uh, diatoms produce, uh, are a significant part of the sea food chain. Phytoplankton, major part is diatoms. It's important for all kinds of sea creatures to eat and that produces a lot of the Earth's uh, atmospheric oxygen. There's a little micrograph of diatoms. There are probably a couple of thousand different species of diatoms, all kinds of interesting shapes if you've never done it. Google them and look at some of them are just remarkably cool looking things in uh, scanning electron micrographs to show these beautiful uh, objects formed naturally. You can see those shells, you don't need to worry about that, how the shells we produce. Uh, dinoflagellates <coughs> are another type um, that are known for, they have another type of plate-like, hard plate-like cell wall, uh, but it's not, made, it's not made of silica in this case, it's made of cellulose, but uh, they have flagella to allow them to swim along. They, they're famous for producing 
neurotoxins that can cause disease. Red tide, uh, can, when there's a big bloom of these things in the ocean, it can uh, kill fish and it can also sicken people who eat contaminated fish. Uh, Ciguatera is a, a, a neurotoxin disease endemic to the Caribbean islands and Pacific islands, in which <coughs> so type of dinoflagellite secretes a, a neurotoxin that gets into fish and you know, people, you get, people get exposed to the water and get tox intoxicated. There's a little picture of a red tide, a gross looking thing of this mass of, of dinoflagellites multiplying. Oh, my coda, we can just take this right out of here. Water molds are extremely prevalent and very important lights of, probably the major, the major lights of, of, um, of plants and crop plants, but we're not going to agree about that at all. There's no diseases associated with it. <coughs> I'll see go off, off under that. So what we'll do is cut off here and start up again for part two, and we'll look at uh, protozoa and helminths. I'm sure you'll very much enjoy helminths, I think.